one. So, Marcella, we we're picking back up where we left off in this conversation. I want to switch up a little bit because we were talking just now about Garfana Duo and the Garfana experience, right? And talking about how we've been able to move in ways that other cultures have not seemed to really master. And I want to get a little bit of perspective because I experience this a lot too. And I was talking to some of my friends last yesterday when I took my daughter to the pool mm -hmm. um, because their daughter made a comment about Apollonia. My daughter, uh, my youngest is, um, and I'm not really big on labels and I'm. this is the point that I'm coming to. Mm -hmm. We raised our kids to be aware that people are different, but the concept of difference does not come from a place of hurt and woundedness. And mm -hmm. I don't know what it is you guys did or didn't do for me to be able to pinpoint it in such a way to say, this is what you should do with your children. But I never was really aware that there was something wrong with being Garifuna or something wrong with being black or something wrong with being female because there was something that happened or did not happen in my upbringing that mm -hmm. made me think I could do whatever it is I wanted. And I can't think of any specifics outside of you always saying you could do whatever you want you could do whatever you want and not knowing how unique saying that was at the time that I was growing up until I started having my own children and so to the incident yesterday where the young lady the little girl was saying to Apollonia wow you're really brown you know and because she had been in the sun and she took off her her bathing suit top and she had this like extreme tan and the little girl was like wow that's a really extreme tan and her mom was a little embarrassed you know having been a fairer complexion and I was just like no it's okay she tans very well so I was using it as an opportunity to say yeah we're all different but that's not a problem. She knows that she tans very well. There's nothing wrong with that. And so um, talk a little bit about that because I remember you saying to me specifically that you had the same experience that you were the only little brown mm -hmm. dot in a lot of sea of fairness <laughs> and you didn't really recognize that as an issue. But looking mm -hmm. back now, it's like, okay, your parents did something or did not do something that allowed you to be able to move in these spaces like Ford Foundation, Car um, Carnegie Cooperation of Fellowships, the Kellogg Foundation of International Leaders Fellows. How many of people like you are in these organizations moving the way you did? What made you think you could have the audacity to get in these circles. So speak a little bit on that. I think that's a very good question because uh, it goes back to the upbringing and your sense of self of an identity, my sense, you know? Um, and the, that's the uniqueness about being Garifuna that is a precious gift. And uh, I've interacted with a lot of people from the Caribbean and being here in the United States, gives me an interesting reminder about it, you know, um, because first of all, coming, living in an environment in Belize where um, most of us are people of color, I hardly remember seeing people who were not of color around me growing up. So, so the concept is different perhaps than if I had grown up in the United States. Yet I'm learning from my colleagues that um, like those people who are not colorful, like I speak with Dr. Annabelle, for example, and she has the same kind of attitude the opposite way because her environment was one where they were all the same, you know? So it's when you move, when you are in an environment where there's competition for resources, for attention, for whatever, then it becomes more blatant. And here in the United States is a distinguishing experience of it, you know, because it was um, because of the way in which the country was founded, I want to say, right? The history. 
where people were brought across here to be enslaved and they were not considered human beings and so on and so on, you know? And you have a reality where there's this competition for resources or this appropriation of resources. So I came, I have the Garifuna experience is a powerful one. And the fact that even though we did have prejudice, we might not have had racism. For example, you have the enslaved people um, in the country deliberately kept separate from us and that kind of thing and the divide and rule all of that took place however that's a different um, dynamic from being the way how I was brought up prepared to navigate any space so when I went to school at St. Catherine's Academy mm -hmm. I told that I was the only Garifuna or one of two Garifuna in the school and when I was told that I wasn't looking for it I didn't have that mm -hmm. in my room mm -hmm. and when I was told that my response was so what <laughs> because right, right. I made a foundation where we believe that I am not one and no one is better than me and also and so you you broke up right there when you were saying that so i want you to repeat that because that's a really important point from our parental or pa the parents that are listening you just repeat that again I better than me better than anyone so you are not no one is better than you and you're better than no one so right so the attitude of equality in my mind. So even was treating me um, negative, I would moon immediately. Be like blatantly abusive, you know. When it came to um, oh, I was valued or devalued. Mm -hmm. You got that? So, yes. Yes. Uh, so when she brought it to my attention, it is then I began, but not deep about disparity, you know? So like I had the audacity to run for president of the student council, not knowing that that was something that certain privileged families would do, <laughs> you know? It was not a question in my mind. Like nobody could tell me that I couldn't do it. Well, nobody would have said it out of mouth. But behavior is something that would speak. Like I, for example, went to one of the exclusive clubs in Belize City a couple of years ago, right? And found out that uh, I was with a colleague who was um who is not Garifuna, right? And who is not a person of color. And when I would be in this space, I would be treated as if I wasn't there, like I don't exist. You know, so I could not ignore that fact that they would speak directly to my colleague and ignore me. And that happened over and over, but yeah. I would not have said it off with a you think you know i'm not started off with a complex of right right i mean do you think that you you probably might have felt a little bit of um, this is not a leading question because i notice it here as well in certain circles like um first i used to think depending on who i was talking to like if i would go somewhere with my husband that happens to me a lot people do automatically speak to him and they don't speak to me and at first if it would be a man i would think that's just you know, men just talk to men. They don't want to feel disrespectful to the relationship or whatever. There might be some background to that, but I became more and more conscious of it with with other with all people. And one time, I even brought it up to someone, like you know, um, and I would start to speak in the conversation, and then I automatically noticed that it's not that because this person thinks, you know. Um, they don't want to talk to, not because a person doesn't want to talk to me because I'm black, 
what they just automatically assume because I'm not German and we're speaking in German that my understanding of the conversation is extremely limited because it's not my first language. And the minute I open my mouth and I take control of the situation and say, hey, I'm here too and I can speak and I know I take an interest, then they're surprised, in some cases flabbergasted and embarrassed also that they're so surprised. I'm like, well, yes, I do live in Germany. I have to speak the language at some point. So yes, surprise, I can speak German. And then they're kind of like relieved, like they can engage me in conversation. But if I can come in the conversation with this complex, like you said, like, oh, nobody don't want to talk to me because I'm black, then you miss out on giving people an opportunity to really interact with you. And it's, so it's, it's really, sometimes about approach but do you think that in some cases like you know it had to be brought to your attention that maybe because it, you didn't come in with that awareness that ignorance was probably bliss or is it really a thing of it's really dependent on the person and the upbringing because if you, let's look at the obamas and the the people in uh, in, in the United States specifically, who have been able to accomplish great things, regardless of where you stand on what they have accomplished, there are people of Black African descent or African Americans in America and all over the world who have accomplished many things. Do you think that what is so unique and different and special about these people that we can say, you know, there is something to being able to walk and be in certain circles without right. having to right. be too aware of the differences that we have. Before I respond, I want to uh, mention that I don't want to downplay institutionalized racism. I don't want to downplay that fact, you know? Meaning that um, when I was to go to South Africa, um, we were told that we needed to get a document making us honorary white. So that really helped in my journey of understanding that is not how I think, how I feel, and how I believe that this is the reality. But, um, and also that there are actually people who intentionally keep people out because of their color and it couple ways nowadays, but it's still meaning that certain clubs you can only get in if you can pay a certain amount of money. And the economic reality is aligned with the people who do not have that kind of access. So the work that we were doing with the award, the Duke of Edinburgh Award, mentoring young people, was brilliant in terms of breaking down those barriers, you know? You know that we took young people from the disadvantaged area into spaces of eminence, you know, to give them the opportunity to break down that kind of barrier. So we would have been very um, engaged. Hello, we have been very engaged with um, US ambassador, foreign affairs minister. So no one, just to send that message of nobody's better than you, or you are not better than somebody, you know? But I am learning, I had to learn, especially visiting here in the United States, that is a reality, that has been a reality. And we've seen it all over the media, you know? And it works two ways, it works, how like we manifest ourselves like the young men, you know, remember we would look at the young men who would be sagging their pants and using this negative language about themselves and so on and so on. So trauma would be an element of conversation because everybody gets traumatized in the experience, you know, the one who is discriminating or separate. Like I have a, a white friend colleague, she went to a museum of the enslaved uh, about a year ago, and she was traumatized because she did not know that all of us had been It was like, she was embarrassed, she was confused, she was ashamed, she came back to me and she was like, wanting to talk about this 
her level of, I'm using the word carefully, ignorance then about what had happened in the United States. You know, I have um, friends, children who told me who are certain, as, as a certain age as children, walking through in Alabama, certain parts of Alabama, where they knew that horrible things had happened there as children, you know, and they would be terrified just walking past the area, even though they themselves had not personally been affected. And when I went to the Museum of the Enslaved, and it was people from all cultures who were doing the tour, everybody was impacted, you know? And even when I went to South Africa, when I went to Soweto, the homeland of Soweto, um, we were a uh, um, mixed group. All of us were impacted. And for us, it was more than racism. It had to do like an assault on humanity and it affected all of us. For us, in not downplaying discrimination, but like for us, racism diluted our interpretation of the experience to reduce it to that, you know? And then I remember speaking to one of my white colleagues about it because I couldn't understand how he could come from apartheid South Africa and be aligning with our cause. And he said for him, he had to. It wasn't a matter of his being white. It was a matter that his caretaker was a black woman. So how could he not feel for her, you know? So it's a lot of, it's not black and white in a sense, you know, L literally and figuratively speaking, it's our experience and engaging with humanity that I would like to explore. This is what Garifuna brings into the conversation. Garifuna brings healing. Garifuna is like a bomb. We Garifuna people. So when I was dancing with the prince, from uh, when he visited Belize, you know, Prince William, Kate and William, mm -hmm. uh, William, mm -hmm. and we were dancing. And um, I said to him, We are dancing to heal our relationships with one another. And I was critiqued by many of my Garifuna people because their um, take on it and people of color was that. Here I am like dancing with the enemy in quotation marks, right? And I said to them, no, we have to move forward in our interaction and healing of each other. And what I said to Prince William was that dancing is not entertainment. Garifuna culture is not performance or entertainment. It's a healing ourselves. When we are in the Dabuyeba, we are reenacting some of the trauma that we went through to release it. You know, we're dancing, we're singing, even what we eat and how, how we dress is a manifestation of healing. And that resonates with other people as well. That resonates with other people as well. So um, you talk about the interaction and this seems to be something that is a common thread uh, within the Garifuna spirituality and Garifuna culture is the ability or the need or the, the, um, the desire to wanna to interact with other cultures for more peace and healing among ourselves. It's sort of like the Nelson Mandela approach because even though you had to be made honorary white in order to go to South Africa, you still did that. You know, the, the, the you, end of that story was you ended up in South Africa anyways. And with your- I end up with because they released the requirement before I traveled. Well, I was okay, not going to. You were not going to do it? I was, no, I wasn't going to do it. The reason why, why I wasn't going to do it because I'm not going to deny who I am. I'm not white. I couldn't, I couldn't pretend to be who I am not. So I did not. But anyway, I didn't have to do that. But I had made a decision that 
that you if weren't that is what it, so i wasn't going to south africa no i'm gonna i'm gonna play angel's advocate now because this is a conversation that's taking place globally on the front of racism prejudice colorism everything that has to do with culture and inclusivity and even to the extent of um, as we become a more global culture and global yeah, citizens, right. where do we draw the line? Because you just mentioned, you had mentioned in our last segment about the the in these um, Native American Indian tribe who were able to uh, maintain their culture within the context of the present climate as to where they live and work. So that's an example of adopting or hybriding your culture. I know I spoke about this in one of the Garifuna Nisha meetings and it was met with some mixed feelings for the very reason that we want to be able to maintain our cultures, but there that doesn't, that's not, that is going to come at a cost or there are going to have, it seems that certain compromises are gonna to have to be made. And so how do you reconcile those compromises and where do you know where where do you know what to compromise and what not to compromise? Because it seems to me that, that you know your principles in certain areas of your life are not always what is for the greater good of the culture. And if you want to be able to survive in the current climate, you're going to have to be able to leave certain things behind. It's the same kind of conversation that people of um, Arabic M Muslim faith have when they move to Germany. Some women have to cover themselves from head to toe, no eyes, nose, nothing. All you see is a sheet coming out. That's not allowed in certain European countries, yet women do that because they have the freedom of religion. But that contradicts the religious, not the religious, the, the, um, the rules, laws, and cultural dynamics of the country where they're living. But these people are fleeing religious persecution, yet you as a Christian walk down the street with a cross you will be persecuted by Germans, Muslims, everybody, because it is no longer acceptable. And so people hide in secret and pray if they're of a certain faith, for example, here. So my question goes back to the principle of what is what principles are, you know, are are can you maybe compromise in order for the greater good? Because it wasn't just about you going to South Africa, it was about going to South Africa to represent a people in a space that is important for this representation to be taking place. That's a very good point. And I actually had a dilemma with it, you know. Um, I, when I was um, presented with it, I, my attitude initially was, um, put me on the next plane back home right now. I will not participate in this conversation. However, my facilitator spoke with me along the lines you are talking and um, I decided to listen because of who I represent. However, it's a personal choice and this is where one has to decide and draw the line, you know? So like there are some Garifuna who refuse to be enslaved and they rather die and jump over a cliff than be enslaved as they were being pursued by the Europeans. And there are some Garifuna who decided that they would acquiesce, you know? So I'm not seeing it as good or bad, you know? It's just choice. I made certain decisions in my life where, for example, I was experiencing a sexual harassment situation and I was told to do something to deny that it had happened. I was to write a document to say that it never took place. I made the choice that I wasn't going to lie. You know, I have to live it myself. I have to live with truth. As a result of making that decision, I lost a top job and position in the Caribbean. I have no regrets about doing that. Even though I suffered and I was ostracized as a result, it's a principle I chose to take. You know what I'm saying? I had to learn to live with myself and live with truth. So it's a personal choice many times. And I'm thankful that I made the choice because years later and so many children later, the very people who were critiquing me are now celebrating me. 
You know, it's about time and timing and holding your ground and sometimes you stand alone. It's whether you are willing to pay the price. So that's a moral decision that each person or people need to take, you know? Deep. Um, so, so deep. <laughs> I mean, it's a, it's a, I, I love these kinds of conversations because it's a, that is a, it's a very tricky one in terms of the current climate that we've just gotten out of where people are making these personal decisions um, and it's become public knowledge because you just can't say like you could before I make a personal want, decision and it and that's right, it. every decision. Want, Sorry, go ahead. I want to judge there are people, for example, no, 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 who that's... are here in the United States, right? Mm -hmm. And let's say stopped by the immigration people, or let's say you are asked where you are a U.S. citizen. Some lie and say, yes, I am. I never lie. I never, never lie. When I was asked whether I am a U.S. citizen, a particular situation, I said, no, I'm not. And, you know, for some people, when you say, no, I am not, that has an impact on your status. You could be deported. You go through all kind of things. Well, I will be the one who will go through the all kind of thing and live with myself, you know, but it's not a judgment call. Whoever does it, you know what I'm saying? I'm saying me personally will not lie. I am not a U.S. citizen. I won't say that I am. A lot of people would say that and it's not the truth. So it's a judgment call for the person, the individual, you know, mm -hmm. but those principles that I stand by. <laughs> um, so let me continue along those lines because we talk about family and being family oriented are some of the decisions that you made or any of the decisions that you made as an individual have had an impact on your um, your family life um, and, and is honesty always the best policy for me honesty is always the best policy All right. and I am willing to pay the price and yes, I suffered because of being honest. And um, it has had an impact because other people uh, in particular expectation of you or of me could be different, no? Mm -hmm. And so um, it's also about communication and working through and healing, you know, and being, and being loving and being forgiving. When it comes to family, the family dynamic um, is very different from the community village dynamic. Although it takes families to uh, make up community. So um, like our family, my family, the Ellis family is known as being very educated people. We are educators mm -hmm. in the eyes of the community, the village, the country. Now, I would be different, I think, in the sense that I don't look at the formal education as the only way of being educated. I'm different, not just in my family, but in the country. I celebrate people who are not doctors and, you know, people who have gone to university and so on. And so my responsibility or my passion is to uplift and to identify the people like your great grandmother who did not go to primary school but was able to navigate systems in Central America to do trading, right? And she was very practical and hands on. Um, Dr. Narciso Torres, right? Who yeah. recently, because of me, my effort. Uh, along with Dr. Annabelle Ford, mm -hmm. we're able to have him get the Chancellor's Award. This As man did guys, Let me just take a pin in that. If you guys want to check out that video where I interviewed Dr. Ford on her work with Forest Gardeners and um, Dr. Narciso, you can check out my other video. I'm going to post it either here or here or somewhere along the screen so you guys can go check that out. Okay, continue. Yeah, so what I am, my spirit and uh, energy is walking the talk, making lemonade out of lemons, 
changing the narrative to set an example, you know? So it's not dwelling on, I pour me one, everything for pour me one, but to really intentionally identify those people, those hidden heroes who would be taken for granted. Like yeah. Regina Martinez, the mother of 14 children, Adrian's mom. Mm -hmm. you know, this woman did not finish primary high school. She didn't go to high school, but she's one of the pioneers of women's movement and organizing in so the country. Yeah, so you, talking about women's um, movement and organizing, you did a lot of organizing in Belize and in the region, uh, in the Caribbean region. Um, you worked with the Belize Human Rights Commission. You worked with the Belize Community of Women in Development. You worked with the Belize Union of Students and Youth, the Belize Rural Women's Association. I actually remember a lot of your work there and you studied at the Hague. You studied um, social studies in the in the Netherlands um, at the Hague. So we only have seven minutes, and I know you said you wanted to go to church. I'm trying to capitalize on your time while I still have you before you flip and flight off somewhere else. So should I go top down or bottom up? You want to start with the Hague, or should we start with Belize Human Rights Commission? Well, I want to say that all of them are connected. And, yes. Um, so from where I began, mm -hmm. um, the foundation built in. I remember, I was told I could be whoever I could be, and so I passed it on to my own children. Mm -hmm. So when I woke up today and said I want to be an astronaut, well, of course the seed was planted because our parents made us listen to the news, right? Mm -hmm. So when man to the moon. That planted a seed in my spirit as a child. And um, the books that my dad would make me read and my mom would buy these children encyclopedias that gave me a sense of the world, you know? So from then I wanted to travel the world because I was already traveling the world. And also being Garifuna, we are, we are pioneers, we are explorers, we are innovators, you know? We are inventors. So um, I give credit to that foundation that was built in my family and in my community. So going to the Hague, I had that spirit in me so that I would speak it. Even before I open my mouth, people say that I carry myself in a way of being purposeful and from the time I was a child. But I was told Nehana, my uncle would look on the picture with Queen Elizabeth and he'd tell me that I am like her or even better. He told me as a child. So I grew up with that sense that I am a queen. You know, I would look at Queen Elizabeth and that's me. I mean, not literally, but you know what I mean, right? <laughs> and so the journey was having that openness to pioneer. It wasn't just, well, oh, we have these problems, but um, that nothing can be done about it. It would be like, so we have these problems, which I call challenges. What can we do? And so all those things that you talk about, I pioneered them. For me, there's always a solution. And now that I'm deeper relationship with God, I know and believe that I am made, we are made in images and likeness of God. And therefore with God, all things are possible. So with that, it's not me physically, Cynthia, but my relationship with God that gives a calling and makes these things happen. You have to do, in my mindset, you can do and must do something about the challenges, not talk about it. You know? When COVID, remember right. in the height right. of COVID, I traveled, I traveled the most ever in the height of COVID because of the mindset, the, we break the poverty mindset, change the language. We are not poor, we're not broken. I'm not broke, I'm not, nobody tell me I broke. I could have $2 in my pocket and I don't receive that as who I am, you know? It's like, how do I navigate in the world, in the universe, 
where the resources are. And shame on me if I have all these resources and I'm not leveraging them or developing them. Right. I'm making an excuse. And so it's my responsibility. This is how I have always been to find out, to turn over every soul, every stone, every treasure. If I don't have it or if I don't know, there is someone who has it. There's someone who knows. And if the person is not in my immediate environment, in my country, well, they are somewhere in the world, especially now with access to technology, you know? We just decree and declare it. I am a millionaire. I am a billionaire. And I mean it. Step into it, the power of it right now. No such thing as poverty. You know that. Amen. I would, I would take you to um the lady who was a millionaire, Danny Johnson, right? Mm -hmm. you know well, I think that you raise a really important point about having the right attitude about making sure that there is a solution to problems and finding those solutions. And I don't, do you think that the current climate or the difference between those who do and those who don't is that attitude? Because yes, we talk a lot about, like we talked about institutionalized racism and how that affects people's access to these different resources that are available, but you were able to do a lot of accessing then and now, irregardless of all the institutional racism that may or may not have existed. And what, so I, it brings me back to the question that we don't really have a lot of time to explore today, but we definitely will later on the step-by-step -step process from generation to generation, what needs to happen. And if you are not of those um, uh, mindset or philosophies, if you don't come from that, there is a lot of unlearning and deprogramming that needs to take place in order for you to get there. It's not impossible. And also, I want to add to that, that it is not unique to people of color or people of Black African descent. I, and I know that triggers some Black, Af you know, Africans, Black people, whoever you want to call yourself. I know it's also really offensive in some circles to call people of color, people of color. But non-white people tend to think that this is just a non-white people problem. If you listen to some, like I live in Europe, and if you listen to some of the people of European descent who live here in Germany and who live around this area talk, they sound exactly like some of the people that I have grown up with, having the same kinds of feelings of discrimination and marginalization. And that just make my eyeballs pop open because not a lot of, no, seriously, not a lot of us have that experience to realize how important interconnectivity is because the problem people get triggered by this is not a racial problem. It is a humanitarian problem and it has always been. But the fact that we focus so much on it's only black people or it's only Hispanic people or it's only Jewish, it's not. It is a humanitarian problem, the, uh, the has and the have nots. 